Welcome golf fans, pursuers of knowledge and the almighty dollar. This is your golf guru bringing you the Open Championship. This is my Before the Lock show. And what I cover here is all the ownership projections, whether I'm going to announce the winners of my giveaway, my top value plays. And if I remember while I'm in the ownership projections, I will talk about fades. First off, thank you for stopping by, checking me out if you're new. And I just also want to thank all the new subscribers. We've had a ton here in the last couple of weeks. Thanks for joining the community. I think you're going to find that a lot of the people that are part of this community, we might be a little smaller than the others, uh, but everybody shares a lot of good information. It's a great uh, bunch of people. So I just want to thank everybody for uh, keep on making this grow and uh, let's go win some money this weekend. All right, let's talk about the comp tournaments, kind of the first thing. So I'm going to be uh, referencing these as we go through the guys that I like below 7,500. Um, I consider that my sleepers and my value plays, the guys that are lower in cost and who could ultimately win or definitely differentiate your lineup. And with that said, I always, as kind of my last reference point, uh, always check some comparable tournaments or courses that I think is relevant that shows, hey, if you had success here, you might have success, of course, what we're talking about. And the first one is, of course, the recent 2021 PGA Championship at Kiowa, the Ocean Course. Palmetto Championship, of course, that was a Link Styles course. Um, not a lot of guys played in that that we're going to be looking at, but some did. So I think it's applicable. Of course, you've got all the open uh, history. That's something that we want to look at. The 2015 PGA Championship at Whistling Straits, a Lynx course in Wisconsin on Michigan. Get quite a bit of uh, of weather and wind. The U.S. Open back in 2019, where Gary Woodland won. Of course, Pebble Beach is also on the ocean and is a Lynx course. You got Shinnecock Hills, the U.S. Open in 2018. And then you got Chambers Bay in 2015, the U.S. Open. And last but not least, you've got the U.S. Open 2017 at Aaron Hills, also off the water. Both of those uh, are Lynx and also could have wind. Okay. So just so you understand what I'm kind of going through and looking at the guys and pulling up some courses, uh, you understand why I'm doing that. All right. So with that said, we're going to jump in. We're going to do ownership projections, weather, and then go over uh, my top value plays. All right. So the first thing, I'm jumping over into Fantasy National. This is where I do a lot of my research and analysis. I've stated this multiple times. Not affiliated, but I highly recommend it if you start to want to do your own analysis. And what they have is an ownership projection area. How they get this information, of course, is people like me uh, are inputting the guys that I like. You click on favorites, you generate lineups, and this is where this information come from. Uh, the number that we're going to look at is over here on the far right. And uh, typically, it's, it's pretty close to when the actual lock happens. Uh, I would say it could be a percentage or two points up or down. And we're going to go look through all these guys for you. So this is going to give you an idea if you are looking for ways to differentiate um, or just don't want, you know, want to go against the grain, no matter what analysis or what is telling you, hey, I understand it. I do that myself. Uh, you've got John Rahm, of course, one of the higher owned here uh, at the 11-3. Definitely understand that. One of my picks. You've got Rory, who's had a great, uh, a great open history, but the game is just not where we're Super excited about, except for the Wells Fargo win, but he's at 12%, uh, well, almost 13, if you're interested to kind of differentiate there. Of course, Bruce Kepka, uh, the second highest owned, um, a, a peckable major record. So, you know, again, one of my picks, no no reason. You know, I think DJ um, coming in at this ownership, and I'm recording this around noon on Wednesday, and of course, within 12 hours, uh, these guys will have our first tee shots at 1.30 a.m. Eastern time. So if he sticks around there, you know, I can see putting some lineups together with DJ, you know, come close to winning here before. Not, well, yeah. I mean, he came in second uh, the year of Darren Clark uh, win, but uh, has also, of course, had, you know, great major history. It's just, you know, what's the putter going to do? Um, you know, DJ mentioned as presser that he is always mostly focused not on the distance, but just hitting the fairways. And that's going to be key here. Um, the guys that, you know, I don't care if you're hitting a 250, if you are in the fairway, you're going to have a lot better chance of, you know, making your pars, maybe squeaking in some birdies. Uh, it's just a different mindset. You got Xander coming in at 17. You know, this is funny. Uh, DeChambeau coming in at 6%. Um, you know, I've always had the statement of if you're playing DeChambeau or if they're playing a course that has really deep rough, 
that DeChambeau is a really good play because not only is he going to get further distance, he can take a shorter iron. Also, if you see his swing, it's very upright and he's got a very steep angle of attack. What does that all mean? Is that he has a lot better chance of getting the ball out of that rough and towards the green. So again, you know, um, I think like myself, I'm a little worried that he's going to get in too much trouble um, with the driver, but he's going to change his game plan. He's going to be hitting irons. He's going to be hitting hybrids. So again, a bad, uh, you know, I might build a couple lineups that start out DJ DeChambeau. Just, you never know. They break through. Now you got some, uh, some leverage on the field. And then Jordan Spieth, the highest zone, which also is one of my uh, fab five picks is coming in almost at 27%. So again, another reason. And, and, you know, Jordan, uh, the putter has not been where it was. So just on that alone, I could see why you'd want to maybe differentiate. And then you get down here into like the next level guys. And these guys are all, you know, 14% or less owned. Um, that's JT. Again, someone you could start a lineup with, with Louie. You know, that could be a nice start build. Uh, you got Morikawa, who's never played in open. Uh, he did play over in the Scottish. And I, I'm not sure. He ended up like 71st or something like that. But he's learning. Um, but... You know, if he hits fairways, greens, and uh, his putter could do something, uh, I picked him on that reason. Victor Hovland, same thing, won at uh, in Germany recently, a couple weeks ago, the BMW International. Um, he's at 11%. Troll Hatton, who's just played a ton of Lynx golf, has some good uh, background or, you know, at least experience and finishes on Lynx courses. So, you know, he's a little higher at 14.3. Then you got Cantley and Reed. And, you know, Reed makes sense. But I think people, uh, if you don't really dive into the analysis over his last six months, his putter is not where it used to be. His short game is not where it used to be. Uh, but it makes total sense. Uh, he is hitting that fade now. He's doing a little better off the tee. But I think his short game, for whatever reason, is it's not been where it's at. Uh, of course, Hideki uh, withdrew from the tournament, so don't worry about him. Casey, you know, fairways and greens. It's just whatever the putter does. Uh, Will Z, I think people are fading because of the putter. You know, it's interesting. Finau is almost at 10% and his, he's shown really no game. Um, I already mentioned a web is just his game. Same thing. Uh, everything I understand, he has a hurt back. So probably gonna steer clear of that. Scotty Scheffler, good showing at the Scottish, uh, Texas guy makes total sense. You know, you got Adam Scott, who's had good, uh, good pedigree here. Um, if he can hit the fairways, uh, the putter has been hot. So it's just no shockers there. Of course, Justin Rose, um, you know, has shown up really only at the last couple of majors and had, you know, at least one or two hot rounds, um, you know, leader rounds. So uh, get that. I like Fleetwood. We already talked about him. He's at nine. And then let's just kind of scroll through. I'm not going to go each of these guys. Of course, you got your your past championship golfer of the year uh, coming to defend at 10%. You got Fitzy. I like him. Cam Smith. Now, that was one of my picks, and it's a differentiator pick. And, and nothing... From his history shows that he should do well here, but his game and where he's played in Australia, everything says he should do well. So if that cracks through for us. If you're going to play him along with me, uh, we're going to have a nice leverage point right there. Um, just seeing what else. Oh, and I was just on a side note, Shane Lowry. If you, of course, look at his U.S. I'm sorry, the Open. Uh, he had all miscuts leading up until he won. So. That just kind of shows you um, if Jason Day, if I was OK with his, you know, that his back was going to be fine and he could play four days feeling no issues. I think he's a good play. Um, Leishman, just like Cam, you know, I put a lineup of those guys together because um, I like the differentiation. And again, you know, I think their game suit as long as they can hit fairways. And that's really what it comes down to. If Cameron Smith and Mark Leishman can hit fairways. They're going to be okay. Just, I mean, like everybody, but where they tend to have problems once they get around the green or on the green or even on the approach, I uh, have no issues with those guys. Joaquin Neiman is around the green. That makes me a little nervous. If, it, if, if the winds don't blow, I think Joaquin can be fine. Of course, he hits that low ball flight and should be okay in the wind. It's just the around the green. What makes me nervous at Garcia at six, um, you know, Phil's at 2.8. And, uh, you know, is of course, won in open and has had a uh, good history uh, there. So in a good short game. And, of course, he just won the PGA at Kiowa. So, you know, that three per less than 3% on, I think, you know, Phil's not a bad play here. Uh, can he win this? Probably not. But can he 
top 10, top 20, very possibly. You know, Lee Westwood, I'm shocked that this ownership's not higher. You know, Lee, of course, had that great run in Florida, then had kind of a downfall. I think he just got really burned out and tired. But he's shown some more life. But the guy that can hit fairways and knows how to play these courses is Lee Westwood. So, you know, he, uh, I think if I forgot, he was, what, a shot away from getting into the playoff. Uh, and I, I'm going to blank now, but it was recently at the Open. Molinari passed Open winner. Uh, he's only at 3.6. Daniel Berger, I think this is interesting. I think because of his price and the golfer that he is, but, um, you know, and I didn't go through, but major history with Daniel Berger is not not excellent. We'll put it that way. So, you know, you could go either way on that. I, I wouldn't question it. Bizet and Hoot, you know, great, good Good short game, great putter, so I understand that. Higo, I mean, he's European, of course. Uh, he's played uh, a bit over there, so, you know, should be fine if you want to go to that. Of course, Ricky Fowler, great pedigree uh, in the past at the Opens. Uh, we're going to talk about Harris English for me. You know, Brandon Grace was one of my picks. Let's go through and see some of the higher ones. Alex Noren, we're going to talk about him, funny enough. Uh, I guess I am just picking all kinds of chalk this week. Ryan Palmer, 4.4. That was one of my picks. Um, we're going to talk about Brennan Todd uh, in the value plays. Stuart Sink, of course, won an open. Uh, pretty solid. Two wins. Um, I think I'm going to talk about him, but there's a re- I'll talk to you why, why I'm not going with Sink down here. See if anybody else kind of pops up that's in a high ownership uh, Lucas Hebert. I think I kept I kept calling him uh, Herbert yesterday, funny enough, which I know better. It's technically pronounced Hebert. Um, he was one of my picks, but he was one of my top 15 picks. The Hoff, the Hoffman, uh, he's almost at 7%. And then it's going to probably pretty much lighten out. You got Lucas, no gloves, smell the glover. Um, you know, I thought about him just so you guys know. I don't know why, but his caddy did not was not able to make the trip over with him. So he's going with someone. I don't know if it's his agent or who, but it's it's someone that is not a caddy. Um, and I don't know, you know, how much that will hinder him or not. Back to back wins. I don't see that happening now. Glover has had a pretty good track record here and there uh, in majors. Uh, of course, he's a U.S. Open winner. Uh, that's the last win he had before he won the John Deere. So for that reasoning. Um, I'm kind of not on Lucas Glover. Uh, I really want someone that I know will be fine, you know, good with the putter, and that you know that only pops up once in a while for Lucas. So I'm shying away from him, uh, but but could see why you'd want to play him. You got Chris Kirk at almost four um, percent. You know, I looked at him. Short game makes me a little nervous. His game in the wind makes me a little nervous. Um, he also can struggle hitting the fairway. Sam Burns. You know, it makes total sense. Of course, you know, this is for down here. I mean, his game uh, he's one of the more elite from tee to green. So, but I'm kind of sticking away from my nine, nine. But again, I totally understand the play. And and he had an okay. I think he made the cut at the Scottish. I don't know where he ended up, but uh, he did make the cut at the Scottish. And then everything else is going to probably be, uh, we're going to talk about Johans Vermeer. Um, why he's at 1.5, and then you got a lot of zero percent. Okay, that should give you a good understanding on the ownership side, so you know how to kind of pivot if you'd like uh, away from the chalk. All right, let's go talk weather just so you can get an understanding there, and then we're going to get into uh, the analysis. All right, so you're going to want to use Wind Finder, of course. I always say this if you're playing Showdown, this is even more prevalent, pretty much the classic, unless you're trying to figure out an advantage for the you know morning versus afternoon uh, tea times to hope that gives your guys the best chance to set themselves up good on Thursday to, of course, make the cut on Friday. That I get. But really, when I look through the weather, um, you know, it there I don't see a lot of advantage. So you can see the early tea times, and this should be their local, yeah, local time for them. So, you know, just so you know, and they're teeing off, I think around 6.30, 7 o'clock a.m., I think 635 is their first tea time over there. Um, and that's a lot due to light. Typically, we get like 730 tea times over in the States. Anyways, where I was going with, you can see they're going to get gust in the morning, you know, which typically we always think, you know, shoot guys off in the morning. But what Windfinder is telling us, and you can see the winds picking up uh, today, it's going to hold through and it's going to die down more in the afternoon. So it's almost opposite of what you typically think. 
So you can do that with, you You know, of course, you're on the uh, North Sea and a squall or whatever can come at any time. And so really for me, I'm just going to kind of punt on the weather thing because I think it's going to be so volatile that trying to really figure out if I want to try to go with a morning flight, an afternoon flight, I'm just going to try at least for the value plays, uh, pick the guys that I know can handle themselves on bent greens and in the wind. And that's the guys you're going to see and hear me talk about. If we look at the Friday, Saturday, kind of the same thing. You know, you're going to have winds uh, somewhere between in the teens, going up in the 20s, gusting. But right now it's saying, you know, no rain. Uh, so the course, as you probably have heard, if you've been watching coverage, of course, they got quite a bit of rain earlier on the week. And uh, but it's starting to already firm up. So I'm guessing from what I'm seeing uh, come the weekend, that course is going to be firm and fast and running. And you can see right now, Sunday looks like the best weather. So that's going to make interesting for a showdown finale or even in your classic that there might be some ability to make some moves, uh, which is not typical. Typically on Sunday, I always think that, uh, you know, in the open, it's kind of hold on. If you're in the lead, hold on. Of course, if you're, you know, below, you're going to take more risks to try to get up there. But I think there could be some, some, you know, this weather holds true, some more swings uh, come Sunday. So what I'm getting all that is, you're, uh, if you have a good classic uh, four-day lineup, even if your guys are maybe in the middle, uh, in the teens, you know, hold on, they might have a chance on Sunday. Okay, I think that's enough about weather. The biggest thing I always say here is go to Windfinder. You're going to want to put in Sandwich Bay. Of course, it's right there on the course, and that's going to give you the most accurate forecast. All right, let's go jump over into Fantasy National, and let's go talk about the guys that I like uh, below 7,500. Um I've already given you a couple. I actually have 20 guys that we're going to uh, look at. And um, usually I do 15, but there's a lot of people here down here that I, I'm going to recommend. And because of the pricing, the softer pricing, because of the great, you know, everybody's here, pretty much um, you're going to get a lot of picks. So my first one, Ricky Fowler, um, you know, I already talked a little bit about him. You know, it's been a lot, you know, the T-ball has actually been not bad with Ricky. Uh, his approach can go a little wacky, but it's the putter, of course. But you can see over his uh, last uh, 12 rounds, he's you know doing pretty well from the 5 to 10 foot range. Um, it's still not Ricky of old where he was draining everything. But, you know, he popped up at the PGA uh, with that T8. He showed up at Memorial, of course, at Mirfield, tough track. Uh, he missed a cut at the Travelers and the Rocket Mortgage, which is uh, Bent Greens. I'm kind of shocked he didn't have a better show. And, of course, he is the main uh, sponsor guy for Rocket Mortgage. Um, you're, for some reason, the ownership projections aren't coming in here, but hopefully you remember. You can just go back and kind of pause the video to see where these guys fall in. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm only going to click on certain guys and go into their comp, comp courses or we'll be here quite quite a while. But I'm just saying Ricky is a play that I, I could definitely understand. Uh, the first that we're going to dive into a little more is Harris English. I think for this price, of course, just coming off a win at the Travelers, you know, had a third at the U.S. Open, had a 14th at Palmetto. And just so you guys know, and I think I mentioned this, um, he actually did have, I believe it was a back injury. So if you remember, he won the Tournament of Champions. He did have an injury. It was never, you know, known. We just thought, oh, you know, Harris English is just, you know, the, the Harris English of uh, great golf is gone. You know, he's back to playing like crap. And that wasn't it. He was actually hurt. And you can see that quickly he started to make a comeback. Now, the putter you can see from five to ten feet is not exactly what I would like, but overall his putting he ranks eighth out of this whole field over the last twelve rounds uh, that he's played. I uh, just want to make that, and you can see you know really strong marks on all the things that I want. Hitting the fairways, right? He hits that little butter fade. Um, good on approach, pretty solid around the green. Good ball striker. Uh, oh, I didn't even need to actually click on him. I apologize for that. We already got his information up because for some reason. Fantasy National, and I'm guessing a lot of people are uh, using the tool right now, uh, are struggling. So the the key things that I want you to notice, and what, what I was looking for, and I mentioned this, is I want the guys that are lower um, to be able to gain on bent over their history. So the from a putting splits, they you know you're going to want to see this bar. And what this is telling you is, ah, he's almost gained. We'll just say a half stroke against the field when he puts on bent. You can see here on difficult. You know where it's very difficult to gain strokes by round, um, which means he's playing. They're playing tough courses, which would be like a U.S. Open, the PGA, the Opens. You know, maybe uh, they're playing the Riviera for the Genesis or Quail Hollow. You know, the Honda. These are what I want to see here, if possible. 
So he's got the trifecta for me. He's getting almost a stroke and a half when it's windy AF. That is uh, as fuck, just so you know what that stands for. Um, you know, even moderate. So that moderate probably is around 10 knots. This is talking about when it gets into 20 knots. Um, so he's on those things. That's like the main thing I'm honestly concerned about. Of course, as always, the stroke gain has been on the way up. He had that little dip again. You can see it back. So he won the tournament of champions. And then he had these miscuts in this 66. This is where he had the back injury. And then you can see, yeah, he missed a cut at the Masters. I'm sorry, not the Masters, at the RBC. But that can happen. That's a tough course, man. I mean, uh, if you don't have your game, uh, you know, it, you're going to be in trouble. But then you can see, like I said, the last few outings, he's been doing real well. And we want to just go look at some history um, comparables. You know, we look at his open history, the five times he's played and he's made the cut four out of the five. His best was a 15th back in 2013. That's a while ago. Um, but it's been a little while since he's played in the open. And then let's go look at the PGA. I want to look at, I got to remember this now. So the most recent that would have been at Kiowa, which I think is a good match. But, you know, he made the cut. Nothing great. 64th. Um, and the other PGA event that I was going to look at is 2015. And that would be Whistling Straits. And he had a 48. So, you know, down here, I'm looking for guys that have made the cut. That's that's a pretty solid thing. And then we go over to the U.S. Open. Of course, uh, I just talked about um, at uh, Torrey Pines. He had a third. He had a fourth uh, in 2020, and that would have been at Wingfoot. And then at Pebble Beach, he had a 58. That's the one I'm kind of you know really focused on. Uh, again, ocean course, kind of a link style. And then if we go look at 2018. He did not play at Shinnecock. Did not play at Chambers Bay, but he did play at Aaron Hills, and he had a 46. So just to give you some ideas, but really um, I'm more concerned about their life of their career, how they've done in the wind and how they do on bent um, when I get down to these guys. And, of course, they had to make it through the first cut, which is where I use that small model and also looking at the putting from 5 to 10 feet. Okay, let's go back. Uh, Thomas Detry, of course, you know, had some solid form. You know, had a couple missed cuts, but that's a U.S. Open. That's a PGA. Understandable. Uh, he's actually not played uh, in an Open in the past, but you can see his 5 to 10 foot, uh, 5 to 10 putting. And you're going to want to keep, I just noticed when I scrolled over this is, uh, even though it is 12 rounds, of course, he doesn't play a lot over on the PGA. But, you know, these last uh, few tournaments uh, have been at the PGA. And, you know, he's making his 5 to 10 footer. So you see, good with the putter, not the greatest around the green. I give him uh, kind of a, I don't know, C minus on the other areas. But I just think recent form, uh, he also had pretty good showing, I believe, at the Irish. I don't know where he ended up at the Scottish. But I know, he, you know, the last couple of tournaments, which were... Uh, you know, he's done pretty well on the European side. Of course, Matty Wallace, you know, someone that I thought for sure I was going to want to play as a value play. But the more I just dove into him, um, you know, I think I think you can play him. Uh, of course, you know, if we look at his history at the Open uh, or in Majors, he typically shows up. Now, he had a 51st to last a cup before that. Right, he had a good showing almost, uh, I believe it was the Valero. He almost won. Um, you know, his putter has been pretty good. He's been, he was playing pretty solid golf. This is again, over his last 12 rounds, you can see the putter kind of has fallen apart approach. Um, but the driver's still there, you know, decent ball striking and I'll click on him. He's not one of my top value plays, but I wanted to see, I believe, of course he can handle the win. I'm just going to verify for you. So yeah, I mean, he doesn't gain a ton, um, but he can play in the win. And of course, you know, European England, um, you know, he's neutral on bent. But, uh, yeah, just wasn't enough there for me. And, again, I'm going to give you guys my top five value plays out of here. Uh, but also, I mean, you know, plugging him in here and there, not going to be a problem. Jason Kokrak, um, you know, again, he doesn't uh, – he had a T32 at uh, Portrush, uh, missed a cut the year before. You know, someone that I thought for sure I was going to be on again. Uh, but for that price tag, I think it's definitely worth You can see, you know, the putter, of course, he got the new putter. I've talked about this multiple times. His putting's been awesome uh, lately. Uh, you know, 19th over his last 23. I mean, everything is good. It's around the greens, and he's going to, and I just think you're going to, especially as the course firms up, you're going to be doing a lot of chipping uh, or getting creative with a three wood or putting. Um, also he's just struggles really bad in the sand. 
Um, so that's what kind of got me off of even making him a top 15 pick. Uh, but everything else pretty solid. So the next guy that I'm going to talk and we're going to dive a little deeper into is Alex Noren. Of course, you can see, you know, his putter from five to 10 has been super hot. Um, you know, he had a missed miscut at the John Deere, but at T4 at the Rocket. So kind of back and forth, miscut at Palmetto, which is, you know, a Lynx. Then he had a 13th at Memorial, showed up at the PGA at Kiowa. Um, you know, the putter's been really good. He's been driving the ball good. So really, you know, honestly, the, the things that I'm also looking for with these guys is, man, I want him to hit fairways because I think it's going to be a, a rough go if you're not in the fairways here. And then, of course, getting your opportunities and making the putts. Um, but we go click on Noren. Actually, I already got him up. Again, the main two things I wanted to see is that over his life, he gains on bent and that he can handle the wind. And he gains almost a stroke against the field when it's super windy. And as you saw, as long as it holds up. And I mean, when you're off the water, you're going to have some wind no matter what. I mean, it is pretty rare that you're just off the North Sea or just have a dead calm day. Um, and also from a difficult, you know, not the greatest, but still it's not down. He's gaining, you know, of 0.3 uh, strokes against the field. You can see stroke gain been on trending on the way up. And, uh, oh, I already got this pulled up. So while we're here, let's just go ahead and look at it. So this is the U.S. Opens. I was looking at his uh, background on that. So the ones that I wanted to focus, 2000. So he missed at Chambers Bay. He missed the cut at Aaron Hills. Um, about 2018 at Shinnecock. He had a 25th. Um, and then 2019, that would have been Pebble Beach. He missed a cut. And then uh, more recently at Wingfoot, uh, he made the cut, had a 17th. So, and Wingfoot, of course, I'm not saying that's a link. So just tough course, got to keep it in the fairway, right? Uh, the rough was pretty penal. All right, let's go look at his open history. So this is what, and I think is probably going to grab a lot of people's attention. When the guy's in the open, uh, you know, an 11th, a 17th, a 6th, all this is telling me is he can handle a link style course and he can handle the wind. And just that alone makes me say, I'm going to play Norrin. Um, and also the putter. And then uh, we want to look, just see what about the PGA. Sorry, I mentioned a Kiowa. Uh, he had a 55th. And then the one I wanted to look at was, I believe, 2015 at Whistling Straits. And he did not play. So so that's Alex Norrin, someone that I will be uh, definitely on. You know, Ian Poulter, funny enough, I was shocked. And I just never repeat how many missed cuts he has uh for the open, he's only made the cut at least over the last five tries um, in 2007. Now it's shocking because the two things that Ian typically does pretty well is he does hit fairways off the tee, which you can see good drives, ranks fifth, and that's standard. That's just not, I mean, that's over his last 12 rounds, but, um, and his putter, of course, we all know what he can do in the Ryder Cup, but yeah, usually his putter is on, and you can see that here, but why his History there is just so bad. I don't know. And of course, you know, recent form, he had that T3 at Charles Schwab, had a T30 at the PGA at Kiowa, you know, decent. Uh, he had a 25th at Palmetto, which is a link style. Um, you know, the opening at a T40 at, uh, that would be at Torrey. So long story short, you know, I, I could see no reason why you wouldn't want to play him. I, I'm not picking him as one of my top value plays, but I'll sprinkle him in here or there. All right, we got Russ Henley, someone else from a statistical model analysis. You know, he ranks six. He does hit fairways. He can get hot typically on Bermuda, but can get hot with a putter. You can see that right here. That from five to ten feet, he's been in Fuego. Of course, he had a T eleven at John Deere, he had a T nineteen at Travelers, a T thirteen at the Open. Of course, I think even one time, yeah, of course, he was tied for the lead. Missed a cut at Memorial, and then at Kiowa, he had a seventy four. But if you go look, really, when you track Russ Henley's major. Uh, appearances, it's not good. Um, and also you can see kind of hit or miss at the open, a cut in 2018, you know, a cut in 2016, a cut in 2014, but then, you know, you also had a T20 to T30. So again, it, not, a, you know, for 7,200, it's not a terrible play. I'm not picking him as one of my top value plays, but again, maybe I'll sprinkle him in. Minwoo Lee, he's pure. I don't have a lot of stuff on him. You're going to see that. I mean, and this doesn't even show, but of course he just won. The Scottish Open, I showed that in my uh, pick show. He also had a good show, I think, T4 at the Irish Open. Of course, he's a European uh, tour player. Um, but, you know, you can see he's kind of heated up uh, with the putter, which is not typical for him. If you go over, I went and looked at his European stats. I'm not going to jump into it, but just go to europeantour.com, type in Minwoo Lee. 
If you look at the statistics, this is a, an anomaly. The last two rounds is what I see. Um, now, is this a trend that could keep going? For sure. But I'm just letting you know, if you go look at his previous stuff, there was really nothing there that would say, hey, he's going to win the Scottish and do well at the Irish. It's Right now, he's in a good space, a good form. And so with that said, you know, I could definitely see playing him, um, you know, sprinkling him in, especially, of course, in the large DFS plays. Max Home, I really, really wanted to pick. Uh, I'm a Max Homa fan. Um, the guy's just, you know, when it comes to majors, uh, struggles. And uh, I, I, I think, I, let's go, we can go look. Let's go look. Uh, let's, while we're here, because um, I want you guys to see. But the guy plays really difficult courses well, of course, right? I mean, his two wins are on two of their Trevor tracks. And you can see he handles a win. Almost gains a stroke. Now, Bent, he loses on. Poe is his favorite, right? Again, of course, his wins are on the West Coast. Um, you know, I kind of was looking off the tee. You know, typically, you know, he'll even hit three woods. He'll hit the fairways. Can, you know, be pretty, really good on long approaches. Uh, it's around the green and the putter that can bite him in the butt. But if we look at, like, the U.S. Open, he's missed a cut all three times he's been there. If we go look at the PGA. He had a 64th and two missed cuts. Uh, he's actually never played the Open. And then, uh, did I already do the U.S.? Yeah, what else? Uh, I don't know. We can pull up the Masters. Never made the cut. Um, so if you look at all the majors, he's actually made the cut one time. And he's never played the Open. So that's why I really do believe you need to have some experience. I know I talked about Morikawa and Hovland. I think they're a better player than Homa. Um, if Homa just... Even if he missed a cut a couple of times at the open, I would have I would have put him as my top five. So again, I'm just telling you, I see a lot of reasons why you want to play him. I'm just also letting you know historically, it's been a struggle. Um, I put Guido in here, Miguel Soli, and I don't think this is any shocker. I mean, of course, he showed up uh, at the U.S. Open, chipped everything in. Uh, it was ridiculous. So watch out for that. You can see the putter from you know, and again, just want to make sure what this is picking up. So this was picking up, yeah. So it's just picking up these two the Travelers, and U.S. Open. But he's got two showings on the PGA Tournament, and both have been well. Pretty solid European player. Um, you can see everything's green. Um, you know, I'm not going to pull up because he's not going to show up on any of the background stuff. Uh, so there's no reason. But I'm just saying, yeah, definitely understand. Someone actually asked me who I like between Miglazzoli or Lucas Eberer. I won't call him Herbert today. Um, I'm, I'm going with Lucas. That's my own opinion. I think he's got more experience in this. And again, I think experience like the masters for the open, I think is, uh, and I guess it's his first time playing, you know, you could be a little big eyed and, uh, you know, maybe, but you know, the U S open wasn't too much for him to handle. So, you know, you gotta go either way on that, but that's my pick EBR. I put him in here, right? He's had two good showings, uh, at the open. Um, you know, he had his 10th at Palmetto, which is, you know, it wasn't the strongest field. Um, uh, but, it is a Lynx course. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's about it. I mean, he's been just kind of not playing that well, but I just, I'm sure if you don't know EVR, um, of course he started uh, on the European tour, had success there, and then it didn't translate over to the PGA. The next guy that I'm going to dive deeper in, and this might be a little bit of a shocker. I know uh, from a ownership projection is pretty low. I think he was less than 2% when I showed you guys this. But I like Brendan Todd. I've actually got a bet on him. I, I think I already said that in the bet show. I think he's 200 to 1. And uh, if you think about it, Brendan Todd is the last PGA member that has won back-to-back -back PGA tournaments and almost won back-to-back-to-back. -to -back -to -back. He missed it by, I think, you know, I don't, I don't remember if it was a playoff or whatever. I mean, that was back in the turn of 2000, 2019, 2000. Um, but the guy, man, is an amazing putter. And he hits fairways, and that's what I'm looking for. And so if we go jump on Todd so you can see what I'm seeing. Uh, you know, he gains on bent over life almost over half a stroke against the field. He gains over half a stroke uh, in crazy wins because he is so accurate. Not long, but again, I, I don't think it's less than 7,200 yards on this course, especially as it firms up. You're not going to need the length. You can see, as I mentioned, uh, you know, you can see this dip. This is back, back 2017, but you can see since then it's just been on the way up. And Todd's been kind of, you know, back and forth. I mean, you can see the miscut at the Rocket, didn't make the cut at the Open, but then, you know, had an eighth at Charles Schwab, you know, made the cut at the Masters. 
but we'll go plug in some of those, see what if there's anything here. Uh, let's start at the PGA. So I mentioned he missed cut at Kiowa, made the cut at uh, was that Harding Park. Yep. And then back in 2015, he missed a cut at Chambers. Bay. Oh, nope. I apologize. That's for the U.S. Open. At Whistling Straits, he missed a cut. So there's some negatives there, right? Um, I can understand that. Those are kind of links and kind of the courses that I'm looking for them to make. I think the Palmetto, he did not play, which is kind of shocking, but whatever. And then let's go to the U.S. Open um, and take a look. So the recent U.S. Open missed a cut at Torrey. Uh, made the cut, missed the cut at Pebble, and made the cut at Wingfoot. In the 2014, he may have had a 17th, and that was at Pinehurst. So, um, yeah, I mean, he's, he can, you know, get around the majors. But, again, the things that I'm looking for, uh, I like him. And I also like the differentiation. I'm not looking for Todd to probably win this thing, even though I know I bet him 200 to 1. I mean, again, if you told me Phil Mickelson was going to win the PGA at Kiowa, I would have said you're crazy. So you can always go back to that. But um, do I think he could top 20 there's a possibility there yeah for sure all right moving along let's go back and see i already mentioned Stuart sink of course has won the open uh it doesn't show up here now i gotta remember i don't remember what year that is uh it was a while ago like what 2010 was it maybe the year clark before clark i guess i could go look but he has won the open right beat out uh tom watson everybody was hoping old tommy watson would win that one but you can see his tournament history at the Open is solid. A T20, a T24, a T20. Like, there, you know, the putter, though, has recently, um, it's kind of, you know, fallen to the wayside a little. Uh, at the Travelers, he actually could have had a better finish if he could have just made some putts. But you can also see, I mean, of course, he's got back-to-back -back wins this year. He's actually got distance and pretty, pretty decent accuracy. Good on long approach. Um, again, I'll sprinkle him in. And again, if I say, you know, I'm just telling you the guys that I'm picking only five of these guys as my top ones that I like, but all these guys, there's a reason why they're here and I'm talking about them. Kisner is the next guy we're going to dive a little deeper into, right? So Kisner has finally shown some really good form. Uh, had a T8 at the Rocket. That is Mint Greens. Had a T5 at Travelers. Missed a cut at Palmetto, um, but I'm, I'm going off recent, recent form. But if you look over his career at the Open, you know, he's a bulldog, kind of likes, you know, can play in that bad weather. A T30, a T2, a T54, a 76. The putter, of course, is a, is one of his weapons when it's on. You can see against the field over the last 12 round, he ranks three. Round of green, he's solid. And, you know, the driver has been a little wayward uh, over the past 12, but it's been getting better. And if I go on Kisner again, the two things I told you that I was really looking at, he can, you know, gain on bent. He gains almost a half stroke on bent. He can gain over half stroke in windy, crazy conditions. And moderate, same thing. You know, plays difficult tracks pretty well. Um, stroke gain still been trending. You can see right here has been, a, well, this is, a, I apologize, that's just the Open, but it, well, in the U.S. Open, he's kind of struggled off the tee. Let's back that out. Um, but his last two events, he's gained off the tee, gaining on approach. So all across, he's been gaining. So I'm hoping so, some good recent form and that he, you know, sticks with that, of course. If we go look at the PGA... He had a miscut here recently um, at Kiowa, but he had a 19th at Harding Park. And then the other one, I uh, want 2015, he missed a cut at Whistling Straits. Let's go look at the U.S. Opens. Uh, 55th recently. And what about geez, some of the comparables? So Chambers Bay, uh, which is a good comparable course. He had a 12th. I mean, that's a while ago, but he did. 2017, another one that I'm looking at, Aaron Hills. He had a, a 58th. Again, another Lynx, windy course. And then Shinnecock, he missed a cut 2018. And then Pebble Beach, a 49th. So, again, uh, he's got the tools that I know he can be good here. A bit like Brendan Todd. Um, almost a little bit in my brain like a Leishman and a Cam Smith. And what I mean by that is get him around the green, they're going to be good. Um, it's, you know, getting there at, at times, that could be a little bit of a, a struggle, but, uh, I like Kisner. Um, I already picked Richard Bland, so he should not be on here. Uh, I already picked him in my top 15. So yes, great recent form does everything like a Brendan Todd. Uh, really, I think they're almost prototypical hit fairways, make putts. Uh, as long as they're making putts, they can be very, uh, Tringali is, you know, not gonna be one of my top value plays, but you know, the guy's been in great recent form. He's been a good putter. 
Uh, the driver recently has went a little wayward. Let's go click. Okay, so we click on Cam and Tringale, and I just noticed maybe why uh, why Fantasy Nationals run so slow is this thing right here. Maybe this ad uh, they got going on. I think that's interesting. But anyways, um, you can see he gains on bent, but this made me a little nervous. He loses uh, in windy conditions, but, you know, difficult courses he can handle. Of course, he's been in Fuego stroking, uh, you know, over the last couple of years. What I want to look at, so this is this is interesting. This is rare for him, usually off the tee, but this has been six events. Now, you, uh, look, the last five before that, uh, I mean, you could say the last eight, except for this one, he was even against. So something's went a little wacky with the driver with Tringali, and that's all I wanted to really show you guys. But the guy's been solid. Um, I think he's, again, for that price tag, could be a very, you know, get you, get you through. But the guy that I kind of fell to was actually uh, Matt Jones. And a lot of things say don't play Matt Jones from analysis. If you look at the models telling me 109th, you know, recent form hasn't been that great. couple cuts, uh, a T52, a T36, T65. But if you look at his open history, and of course he's an Australian, used to playing in the wind, used to those link style courses, he's made three out of the four cuts, you know, Nothing amazing, but a T30, a T39, a T54. But if we click on Matt Jones, you'll see he does the two things that kind of I want, and that is he does gain on bent or the life of his career. And a putter, you know, likes Bermuda the best. And nothing's super great, but he can get a super hot putter. It's this right here. If the wind blows, he gains about a stroke uh, average against the field. I like that. And, of course, you know, I knew that going in. Hence why I kind of I had eyeballs already on him. And then, of course, at the Honda, um, pretty windy conditions at the Honda. And I'm just, because it's taking a bit, I'm going off memory. I believe he was the only one on round one. Let's go take a look. Yeah. Who shot a 61. I mean, nobody, uh, I mean, Russ Henley had a 64. But under those conditions, that was ridiculous. Um and I don't know if it shows. It says moderate, but it was super windy on uh, playing at the Honda. And that's a tough track. So I like Matt Jones. Oh, I didn't go through. Uh... So let's look at some of the comparables for him just so you can see. All right, we'll pull up the PGA first. And uh, at Kiowa, he had a 30th. Again, a link style course. And there was, you know, some wind that they dealt with. And then if we look at the 2015 uh, that would be the Whistling Straits. Again, he had a 21st. So the guy can handle himself in a major and win. That's what kind of has got me on Matt Jones. Uh, the U.S. Open, you know, not the greatest track history. Uh, but recently at Torrey, um, you know, he had a, a 65th. And, of course, that's on Ocean, too. You know, it's not a Lynx course, but there's definitely some wind that can happen at Torrey Pines. And uh, what else we want to look at? I think that was it. We did the PGA. I don't think he played Palmetto, did he? No. Nope. Okay. So I like Matt Jones. He's one going to be one of my top value plays. You know, I looked at McKenzie Hughes. Um, I know that could sound a little funny, but of course, he had that T15 at the U.S. Open. No history at the Open, which kind of, you know, is why he's not falling in. But the guy, you know, hits fairways, at least over the last 12 rounds. The guy has always been an elite putter. Um, you can see from five to 10 feet, it's been, you know, going nuts. He's been draining them in it. Like I said, always been a good putter. You know, he had a T14 at the rocket. Uh, so recent form has been good. So I, I know, again, someone that I'll sprinkle in. He's not my, be one of my top value plays, but someone I would recommend. And then uh, the last, uh, well, not last, these three guys, uh, Sean Norris. You know, there's nothing that's like amazing with Sean. He's been around for a while. I, I think the guy was born 82. So he's uh what almost 40 um but just over recent you know the putter has been super hot you know his driver will give it like a, a c you know um he had a pretty good showing i believe it was at the irish i think he had a top 10 somewhere around there um i think i mentioned i think he's 500 to one he's got some i bet him and I, and I also bet him like a top 20 i don't know why he also showed up uh, I think he had a good opening round at either the PGA or the U.S. Open. He he was up there on the board uh, for a while. But it's it's a long dart. But I think from a differentiation standpoint, um, he is, I believe he's he's definitely European. I'm just trying to remember off the top of my head. I don't, I don't know if he's a Swede. I know Noren's a Swede. I can't remember. Um, maybe he's, oh, South African. That could be it. 
Uh, anyways, long story short, uh, I, I like Sean Norris. Uh, that you know he would be a pretty good little play down here. And then the last two guys, I'm uh, just gonna quickly. Of course, Troy Merritt uh, has had really good recent form. I don't think it's showing on here, but he even had a couple uh, back-to-back seventh place finish. Um, you know, had a T2 at the Rocket. You know, he missed a cut to John Deere. Uh, the guy has been putting in Fuego. So that's been like a lot of it has been with the putter, and that can only last so long. But you can see uh, from his five to 10 footers over the last bit, he's been killing it. So, and he's a pretty steady guy. Uh, so, I, you know, again, I could see sprinkling in some Troy Merritt. And then it's Johans Vermeer. Uh, I think I, I talked briefly about him. He uh, he's had back to back showings at the Scottish and the Irish. Good uh, top, you know, I think top ten, something like that. Um, you know, there's really not a lot I can show you that's going to help you because he's a, a European player. But I'm just saying he's someone that's on my radar. He's almost at bare men. So if you're down here uh, at this low, this is the guy that I like. Uh, it's a 6100. So that's it. I think. That should help you, uh, you know, get some uh, round your lineups out and lock in and also get some differentiation. All right, let's wrap this thing up. Oh, and uh, yeah, I'm going to, of course, pick, uh, tell you guys who won uh, my giveaway. Okay, with that said, I'm just going to recap my top value plays. I know we just went over these, but I just so you remember, of course, you got Harris English, uh, you know, just won, um, you know, great form. The back's better. He's been just trending, had a good showing at the U.S. Open. Um, yeah, I mean, no reason why you wouldn't want to play Harris. Of course, Norin, great pedigree at the open and uh, has been playing well. He's had some good rounds. You got crazy ass Kisner there. I just, that picture just makes me laugh every time. Elite putter has a good, op- uh, good showing at the open. If the wind blows, he could be very live. He's, I think the score, when the score is lower, uh, he's someone that could be very relevant. Of course, an amazing match play. Matt Jones. 61 at the Honda, won the Honda, tough course, tough wind conditions, an Australian, um, you know, has done well at the Open and other majors I showed you. And last but not least, probably the, you know, the long shot, uh, but Brendan Todd, man, if he uh, just does what he does, hit fairways, make putts, uh, he could be very live here. Again, probably not the win, but uh, I do have a bet I'm at 201. So that gives you your ideals on the top value plays. And then last but not least, uh, here's the winner. So congrats to you guys. Uh, we had 132 people uh, enter, which is the highest I've ever had. Of course, the community base is getting bitter, bet, bigger. So I thank you for that. And uh, the winners I will announce, and I will be reaching out to you guys on YouTube uh, to get your, I need your PayPal email address so I can get you the funds over. But Chris Kilbane, Dave Kenny, Fly on an Albatross 13, John Esterhusen, and Bubba1407, you guys have won each $100. And, of course, you can do whatever you want with it. But if uh, there's uh, there should still be openings in the $100 Million Maker. Uh, I've got some entries in there. You know, hey, it's a lot better odds than trying to hit the 10. And worst case, you double your money. Um, you know, if you just put a decent amount of pick my picks, you at least double your money. We'll say that. That's the hopes. All right, guys. Um, we are, again, less than 12 hours away from this thing getting going. I'm super excited. I'm sure you've been watching a ton of coverage like I have. And I'm just ready for this thing to start. And I hope we all do well. So best of luck to all of us. And again, if you like what I'm doing, you know, click the like button. It always makes me a little happier. If you know anybody else that uh, is getting into DFS golf or that uh, might find this uh, helpful, you know, share it with them. Let's keep growing the community. And, uh, of course, if you're watching this for the first time and you have not subscribed, Please do so because you will then turn on notifications. You'll be notified of all my shows, typically three a week, sometimes even a little more. Um, So you'll get first notifications on that. And also, uh, hey, it helps keep growing the community. And then if I can help you, as always, if you have any questions or any thoughts, uh, want to, you know, bounce something off me, hit me up on YouTube comments or follow me at DFS Golf Guru on Twitter. And uh, the reason why you would want to follow me there is... Typically, uh, if I see anything on withdrawals or anything that kind of comes through, I will let you guys know as soon as possible. All right. Best of luck to you, all of us. And you guys have a great open. And I'll talk to you guys next Monday. All right. Take care.